Hello and welcome to Addressing the COVID-19 Crisis, our weekly open forum uh, series for pharmacists. Uh, we are 30-something uh, weeks into the COVID crisis and conducting these webinars to try to bring the latest information to pharmacists, pharmacy technicians, and student pharmacists across the nation as it relates to the COVID crisis. I'm Michael Hogue, the president of the American Pharmacists Association and the Dean of Loma Linda University School of Pharmacy in Loma Linda, California. I'll be serving as today's moderator. I want to welcome not only our pharmacists and technicians and students who are with us, but I also know that we have a host of other healthcare professionals uh, across the country who have uh, decided to dial into today's program because we're sharing late breaking news uh, from some of the top experts in the nation related to vaccines and the COVID vaccines. Uh, in fact, that's the topic that we're going to be covering today is COVID vaccines and the latest breaking information. And if you've been paying attention at all to the news, you know that there is a lot going on with COVID-19 vaccines. We'll talk about the clinical development and approval of those vaccines, the allocation and distribution plans for those vaccines, as well as how to deal with vaccine hesitancy in your local communities. Now, joining us today are Dr. John Gravenstein. He is uh, the uh, editor of the Immunization Action Coalition's uh, uh, publications. Many of you know uh, IAC's publications at vaccines.org, and he is also the president of Vaccine Dynamics. John is a uh, career-long uh, expert in vaccines and has dedicated his entire career to assisting and helping uh, improve immunization rates in our country. We're also joined by uh, Dr. Steve Foster. Dr. Foster is retired also from the United States Public Health Service. Uh, he is uh, uh, retired from the University of Tennessee College of Pharmacy. Uh, John, uh, Steve is uh, uh, our current APHA liaison to the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. And, uh, and Steve uh, uh, and I have a long uh, friendship and, uh, and, and I've known Steve and consider Steve and John both to be mentors in my professional career as well. We're also joined by Mitch Rothholtz. Uh, Mitch is the Chief of Governance and State Alliances at APHA and is also the Executive Director of the APHA Foundation. Now, Mitch has had a, also a career long commitment to vaccines and Mitch is involved on a day-to-day -day basis with the conversations that happen at the agency level in the federal government related to vaccines. So again, today you're going to be hearing from three experts who are in the know and really know about this uh, topic in great detail. We'll also be joined this week as we are every week by Elisa Bernstein. Uh, Dr. Bernstein is the Vice President, Senior Vice President for Pharmacy Practice and Government Affairs at APHA and had a career, a 30 year career with the FDA. Uh, Elisa will join us during our Q&A session for uh, any questions you might have about uh, federal policies that have come out of HHS related to vaccines. Now, we're going to be doing things just a little bit differently today with our webinar because there is so much information to share with you and because we already have received in advance of today's uh, webinar multiple, multiple questions. And so we'll be doing things just a little different. And one of the most important things for you to know is that you, if you pre-registered, which all of you did for this webinar, those who are joining live get the opportunity to earn continuing education credits. Related to the CE credits, uh, Steve Foster, John Gravenstein, and Mitch Rothholtz declare the uh, conflicts uh, that you may see here on the slide. Uh, all other individuals associated with the program do not have any conflicts. Our learning objectives are, the, oh, sorry, the CPE uh, information is here. This is a knowledge-based opportunity for you today. On the next slide, we'll see the learning objectives, and I think I've covered those already, uh, but we will talk about these uh, emerging facts uh, related to the vaccines. Next slide, please. Now for uh, pre-test, uh, you all can click on the responses on your screen, but COVID-19 vaccines consisting of mRNA, which of the following is true. You don't have to get it right, and we won't share your answers. We just want to get a test to see uh, where we are with knowledge currently uh, about this. And so just quickly, give it your best guess about COVID-19 vaccines, and I can assure you we'll cover this during the program today. 
Okay, let's uh, move on to the next question. Our second, <coughs> second pre-question, COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, another fact here we'd like you to uh, take a look at about adverse events uh, attributable to vaccination. This is a cause and effect of vaccination. So what's your, what's your opinion about this? Great, thank you all for being quick. We want the quick on the click is important. Uh, it'll help us get to your questions quicker and uh, to answer the, the, the concerns that you may have about the COVID vaccine. So uh, thank you, we'll close this poll and move on to the next question. I think this may be, we may have two more questions. The ACIP met on December 1st, that's just earlier this week and voted to make which of the following groups part of phase 1A, the top priority for immunizations. I wonder how many of you might be aware of this and uh, we see lots of people coming in on answers for this question. So uh, thank you again for being quick to click on your screens and uh, give us your response and we'll close that poll as well. And if you'll go to the next slide, please. So what we're doing differently today, some of you join us every week and have been faithful in uh, learning through the COVID-19 webinar series each week. A couple things we'll do differently today. First of all, in the questions tab uh, on the GoToWebinar control plant panel, you can type in your questions at any time, including right now, uh, to be able to get your questions in the queue uh, so that our speakers can address as many questions as possible today. In the past, during past webinars, we call on individuals verbally to be able to uh, ask their question out loud. Because we have such a huge volume of information and know that you have lots of questions that need to be answered, I will not be calling on audience members out loud to answer your questions, or ask your questions verbally. I will ask your questions for you in order to keep time uh, moving along. So uh, we uh, ask your understanding related to that. The second thing that's a little different this week, normally during this webinar series, we take questions about any topic related to COVID-19 not just the topic that our subject is on today. So in today's case, vaccines. Today, because vaccines are such a hot topic and this is such breaking news, uh, we will not be answering non-vaccine related questions during today's webinar. However, if you have a question that's not vaccine related, you may in fact put it into the question bar. And then for those of you who are members of APHA, you have the ability to go to pharmacist.com, log into the website and go to the engage platform for COVID-19. We have a discussion board for APHA members uh, for uh, COVID-19 and we will answer the questions that are not vaccine related in the COVID-19 uh, 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 information sharing engage platform. So you can find the answers to your questions there if they're not related to the vaccine. Other than that, everything else we'll do today will be the same as normal. Uh, we will be recording today's webinar. For those of you who are joining uh, and watching this video uh, asynchronously through the recorded version, we are sorry, but CE was only available for those individuals who watched this live on the day it was broadcast. Uh, but hopefully you'll still enjoy the information that you'll see in today's webinar. Secondly, there is a handout in the handouts tab. All of the slides that we're going to cover today are in the handout with active links to directly to the resources that you will need. I will share with you that we have provided additional content at the end of today's presentation that will not be covered directly in the presentation, but are additional reference resources for you. And we'll talk about that as we go through the program. So there are extra slides, so to speak, associated with this program for your learning benefit. And we wanted to make sure that you had everything that you needed. So today we're going to get to all of the questions we can get to. And right now I'm going to ask our three distinguished guests, uh, John, Steve, and Mitch to join me on camera so that we can have a discussion about the COVID vaccines. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for joining us and uh, appreciate your time and attention to, uh, to uh, uh, all that you're doing uh, related to improving public health through COVID vaccines. So thanks guys, appreciate it. Pleasure. Uh, Steve, let's jump right into this. Uh, you're representing APHA on the ACIP as the only pharmacist in the room. Um, can you tell us about the evidence to recommendation framework uh, that, the, that the ACIP is using to drive their decisions in terms of 
who gets vaccine and so forth. How, how are they doing that? Can you explain that to our audience? I certainly can. Thank, thank you, though, very much for inviting me to this. And by the way, I would like to point out there is a fourth expert in this group, and that is Dr. Michael Ho. Michael has served as the, uh, the representative on the COVID working group for the ACIP. So he has actually been into more meetings than I have. So, um, so uh, again, we thank you for your service for what you're doing, uh, in addition to everything else that you got on your plate. Um, when we take a look at, uh, at vaccines individually, we look at what's called the evidence rec recommendation framework. And you can see this here, and I'm gonna talk about each of these individually. The one thing though that, that uh, in the red one on the top, is that the benefits and harms, we cannot discuss that until the vaccine has actually gone through the FDA approval process. Uh, and so while this is about individual vaccines, there are certain components of this that we could discuss ahead of time and have it ready so when the vaccine's there to do it. Uh, another part of Operation uh, Warp Speed, I would guess. Um, I'm gonna, not gonna spend much time on the equity because that was a broadcast you guys had last week or the week before, but anyway, it was you guys covered it quite extensively and, and we're, we're gonna just briefly mention that. Uh, so next slide, please. The first uh, thing, this is a, the from a couple of days ago, you can see where the, the number of cases we have. So the first domain was, is this a, a problem of public health importance? So it's very obvious that here it is. Uh, it is very much a public health importance. Um, one of the things that we considered in this though was the different populations. And I'm just gonna mention a couple of them. One is the number of healthcare workers we have in this country, because this influenced the decision that was made uh, a couple of days ago. There's 243,000 cases uh, out of the 2.1 million healthcare workers that have occurred in this country so far, along with 858 deaths. The other group that we discussed too was the long-term care facility. And they've actually seen within the, uh, there's 2.1 million patients in there, but they've seen 6% of all the cases and 40% of the deaths. So this was a very much a high risk group. So uh, public health, uh, that was the public health problem. Next slide. So for the values, the question is, is the target population value the, the, um, the vaccine itself? And when they did acceptability studies, it shows that overall it's about 42 to 86% of the population accepts the vac vaccine, but it's based upon what they hear in the news and also the news that they hear about the efficacy and safety. Um, when you take a look at the uh, intention to get vaccinated, again, that varies very much by the population. You see people all the time are saying, no, I don't, I don't want the vaccine at all. And also, um, many may not want it at first, but as time goes on, then they're gonna see everybody else has gotten it safer to use, they're gonna to go to do that. But fear is what's driving this process at the initial phase of it. For the acceptability, is it acceptable to the stakeholders? In other words, the healthcare providers. There's been two surveys, one of them by the CSC that showed about 63% of healthcare providers say they would get the vaccine. A survey by the nurses said 34% would voluntarily receive it. Out of that 34% of the nurses, the 57% of them said that they were, were comfortable in discussing it with the patients. This is one thing I want to point out to that when we talk about the amount of, of doses that are available, you have to take a look here and say approximately half people say they won't get it to begin with. So that may make more available for the people as time goes on, but we won't know that until we get into it. The other thing on acceptability is that all of the states have submitted, the health departments have submitted to the CDC a plan. And I might add that once the CDC makes the suggestion of what what to do, it really, a lot of it is based upon what the state decides to do. So it can be different in each state as we go along. Pharmacy, though, on the other hand, is very much committed to participate. Uh, CVS and Walgreens have agreed to do the long-term care uh, facilities. Um, other, other pharmacies have also agreed to that too, but that was the initial ones that committed. And so um, that was a, a very good part of it. Next slide, please. On feasibility, the question that comes up was, is it feasible to implement this process? Well. Uh, for the financial part of it, it's not, it is a barrier, but not much of a barrier. And I'll talk about that on resources in a minute. What makes it complex though, is that all the vaccines are different. So it depends on which vaccine comes up, uh, whether we're gonna be able to, to do it or not. Uh, access may be limited, particularly in some of the rural areas. And then again, everybody knows the storage handling and handling component of it is a very difficult component too. Uh, the resources, is it re have we used the resources appropriately? Or are the resources available? Well, they estimated that if 20% of the patient got po uh, population got infected, there'd be $163 billion in direct medical costs. Um, again, 10 billion went to warp speed to, and, and I think John's gonna talk about that part in a little bit about the, about the studies. Um, but basically, since the vaccine's gonna be provided at no cost to the individual, that makes it worthwhile. 
Uh, cost effectiveness during a pandemic is really not a big issue at this point. Next slide. As I said, I'm not going to deal a lot on equity because we, we this was a very major component of the discussion over many, many months. Um, and it is very important to make sure this vaccine gets used. And the uh, what population gets the vaccine may depend on, on again, what vaccine is used, is, is it able to get it there. But in a disadvantaged group, we know the group must, it has to be accessible, but it also has to be acceptable too. And uh, it has to be effective and it has to be used by the population for it to work. So these are the issues that, that are uh, coming up as we discuss about the vaccines in general. So these were the topics that were discussed about uh, before the actual individual vaccine, but we will discuss this in conjunction with the individual vaccine when it comes up. Next slide. So here's the results that they said, is it a public health problem? Yes, again, we're, benefits and harms are individual vaccines. Acceptable uh, are the values. Does the target population find it? Probably yes, there's some that, that don't, it varies. Uh, is it acceptable to the uh, providers? Probably yes, uh, though that varies within the groups too. Is it feasible? That's the problem is that we think it is, but we're not gonna know until we try some of the different methods and it gets out into the states in the hands. Uh, was it reasonable and efficient use of resources? Yes. Uh, and equity depends on the vaccine, basically. Some say yes in certain groups, some say no in certain groups. So again, this is the this is the objective stuff that we look at at the ACIP during the meetings there. Okay, well, thanks, uh, uh, Steve, for covering that. That's a really great overview of the decision-making process that the ACIP is going through. And I want to emphasize to our audience that uh, this is not just a discussion that's happened and it won't happen again. Uh, ACIP is actually meeting on a very regular basis uh, and, and uh, responding quickly to do these analyses, not only for the vaccines overall, but for each individual vaccine as it comes before the committee. Uh, this scientific review will happen for each and every one. So, Steve, this week, the um, ACIP on December 1st voted to adopt an interim recommendation prior to the FDA's approval. And I wonder if you would just share with us what that decision was. Was it a vote of the committee? And the vote again was 13 to 1. There was one dissent against it. It was decided that the first phase, 1A, will be offered both to healthcare personnel and to residents of long term care facilities. When they talk about healthcare personnel, it's defined as people that are not necessarily just the physicians, nurses, pharmacists, but also people who have direct exposure in the healthcare system to the patients. Uh, and then again, long-term care facilities. As I mentioned before, the, the it's uh, a large amount of deaths, and percentage of deaths that occur in that population. So it felt like that vulnerable population should go first. Next slide, please. Just to show you, this is phase 1A. We have still a phase 1B and a phase 1C. Those two are some, some suggestions of what may be in those phases, but they have not been voted upon yet. There'll be still more discussion. I'm sure there are these discussions are gonna come very soon. And, uh, and so we'll find out more about this as time comes on. Yes, and I wanna reemphasize to our audience that the only vote so far and the only published recommendation yesterday in MMWR that's occurred to this point is an interim recommendation for phase 1A, recommending that upon FDA approval and uh, uh, ACIP uh, uh, vote, uh, the healthcare personnel and long-term care facility residents will be first to be immunized. Now, we've already gotten some questions from our audience related to this issue of healthcare personnel and who qualifies. One of our questions is does pharmacy students, medical students, and nursing students qualify for vaccination? And the answer is yes. There was a very broad definition used by ACIP as to who constitutes a healthcare professional or healthcare worker. And if you look at the definition, it's any person who's paid or unpaid who serves in a healthcare setting. That means language translators in a hospital, the, uh, the, the uh, staff that work in, uh, in food services, the, the cleaning services. facility staff, transportation, uh, patient transportation staff, and the uh, direct healthcare workers. So states may choose to divvy up, if I understand correctly, based on a state, they may decide to prioritize doses at the state level 
but all of those people are included in the a ACIP recommendation. So thanks for that question. Now I wanna move on, John, to talk specifically about the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine because there's a lot going on. And if, uh, if my memory serves me correctly, the FDA's vaccine um, uh, and related biologics uh, committee is going to meet on the 10th of December to discuss a potential EUA authorization for the Pfizer vaccine and on the 17th of December for a potential EUA for the Moderna vaccine. Remind us how these vaccines work. I think it's important that clinicians understand their mechanism first, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the safety and clinical efficacy. Great, easy, easy to do. Um, and shout out to Brian, our champion slide wrangler for getting us to the next slide. He's gonna let me down, there he is, okay. So um, uh, mRNA vaccines, messenger RNA vaccines are in a category that are called nucleic acid vaccines. And you see at the top of that screen, there's a, it says RNA vaccine, there's a syringe and an arrow. So that little, that little thing that looks like a seagull is a little polypeptide that is a snippet of RNA and it's in a lipid coat uh, to protect it when it goes in the body so it doesn't degrade because it's, you know, like insulin could be easily uh, uh, degraded. Uh, it gets injected, it goes into cells, it goes into the cytoplasm, not the nucleus. So part of the internet misinformation that's already out there is you get this vaccine and it screw, screws up your genes, not true. Goes into the cytoplasm, not the nucleus, goes into the weight of the egg, not the yolk, uh, you know, to explain it to the public. Um, and it then triggers the production of proteins. It is essentially, uh, the injection of a blueprint uh, to, to the cause uh, a protein to be developed. M if we, mRNAs are a natural process, like insulin is a natural process. If you took the mRNA out of your body, you would stop making new cells. You would, you, your children wouldn't grow any taller, et cetera. You have to have mRNA uh, to make uh, uh, proteins and, and structures. In this case, that particular blueprint makes the spike protein uh, of the virus, which is the Achilles heel of the virus. If we can make the spike protein, the body reacts to it, makes antibodies against it, and that prevents disease. And that's what has been shown in the press releases so far and will be and is already under FDA review in you know, exhaustive detail. So John, before we move on, I've got an audience question that's related to this. I think it's probably a good time for us to address this. Uh, there has been a lot of uh, misinformation out there from anti-vax groups uh, uh, talking about the use of embryonic stem cells and mRNA vaccines. Can you discuss with our audience uh, the, the real issue there? And can you clarify all of that because it's related to this uh, production process. So first of all, Michael, there's an error in what you just said. It, well, well, let's set it aside. No vaccine, nothing has no interaction at all with embryonic stem cells. So what, what the issue at hand is one that certain cells, MRC5 cells, HEK293 cells, PERC6 cells, have origins in aborted fetuses. That's different from embryonic stem cells. So the issue is abortion. And, and uh, I'm Catholic, in the Catholic tradition and many in several other traditions, um, uh, you know, stopping life is not a good idea, uh, not, not desired. And so to use such derivative cells um, is uh, tainted uh, with, uh, with very few, one, two, three abortions back in the, one in the, two in the 60s, one in the 70s, one in the 80s, and that's it, uh, abortion, so long ago stuff. In the case of mRNAs uh, vaccines, it, they're essentially synthetic, remember, polypeptide. So there's no abortion involvement in production. There's some dispute about whether some uh, laboratory assays used originally in the design and invention uh, involved such cells, but uh, it's a li that's a little less clear, but certainly not in involved in vaccine production. So to be very clear, uh, in response to the question that came from our audience, aborted fetuses cells are not used in the production of mRNA vaccines. Correct. And those interested, I, there's a lot more detail at the National Catholic Bioethics Center for uh, anybody who's interested. 
All right. Well, let's move on then. I thank you for answering that question. Now, as we go into the next slide, uh, you're going to share some information with us about the comparing and contrasting between the Moderna vaccine and the BioNTech Pfizer product. There are some differences and, and share with us those differences so that we're aware. Start with the similarities. Uh, both mRNAs, both uh, both have that lipid coating um, to uh, protect it. Both cell-free, synthetic, IM. The dosing schedule is a little different. 21 days later for the BioNTech product, 28 days later for those two for Moderna's product. Um, in that, that row marked human data, uh, That's those are the numbers from the press releases uh, from the companies. Uh, which which I'm sure they had they took great pain to to make sure that they were correct, but they didn't have all information in it. So you see, I have grayed out. We don't know what the confidence intervals are around those point values, but they're really close, and surely those two numbers are statistically equivalent. Uh, and but the, the the main point is it's extremely good efficacy. That that's what makes me say spike protein is probably the Achilles heel um, for the uh, for the products. Now, uh, as you say, the two different uh, FDA advisory committees are on two different days, the two Thursdays, the 10th and the 17th. Uh, BioNTech goes first. Um, the um, yeah, and so and so a, a couple of days ahead of time, FDA traditionally releases uh, their analysis that they're going to present to the uh, advisory committee. So that that should give us a lot more detail. So that would be the 8th and the 15th, more or less. Uh, that we should get a lot more detail on the numbers and the subsets and age stratifications and that kind of thing. Uh, in the safety summary line, I have, um, uh, again, from the press releases, and more detail will come, uh, these seem to be uh, products that are quite well tolerated, not perfectly uh, inert, <laughs> and, and uh, for obvious reasons, but most, most adverse events, AEs, mild or moderate. And, and, but there are some grade three reactions, grade three defined as interfering with activity of normal living. So uh, enough fatigue to put you on the couch, enough muscle ache to make you not want to lift heavy boxes, uh, et cetera. And those numbers are, we should pay attention to, we should alert patients to be, or potential recipients before they, before they decide whether to get vaccinated. But they're, they're on par with what we have seen with Shingrix, as one example, uh, and other vaccines. So, um, you know, not, not uh, uh, crippling in the sense of a crippling of a program, uh, you know, but we, we should pay attention to it and be honest with our patients. You're on mute, Michael. Uh, pull up the next slide, please. And okay. uh, here's a few other things here to share with the audience. A little bit difference in dosage. Um, that's it's, it's uh, they're both frozen liquids, so they're popsicles, right? Frozen liquids. They're multi-dose vials without preservative. That's unusual. So you have to if you don't complete the completely use the contents, you have to throw it away at the end of the shift. Um, the BioNTech Pfizer product is a concentrate. Which means it needs to be diluted with uh, with normal saline, sodium chloride 0.9%. Uh, according, uh, I won't give the the numerical values, but you need to dilute it before uh, before you administer it. In contrast to the Moderna's is ready to use. The ship the temperatures have been discussed a lot. I've got the Moderna 30 day refrigerated level in blue because that's relatively new information. Um, and then a few hours at room temperature after, uh, you know, for the final phase, you know, just to, as you're getting people to roll up their sleeves, basically. Um, uh, pediatric trials, uh, a, a little bit of teenager data in with the BioNTech product. Uh, Moderna is going to start a teenager trial uh, pretty shortly. And the U.S. government has contracted for 100 million doses of each. The amount that's available in December is going to be a, a subset of that. 10-ish million of both. The numbers keep changing as the manufacturers are, you know, uh, you know, getting everything ready to go. And this is, you know, is everything going to be ready for the dinner party in time? 
uh, you, it's a really complicated logistics exercise. Uh, let me let me get a little clarification on a couple of things. I think pharmacists, especially in the community setting, who may be involved in administering this, are going to have question about. Um, uh, one is uh, once you dilute the uh, BioNTech Pfizer product, um, uh, you you have to use it within six hours. Is that correct? Uh, correct. You, you can't uh, can't that's, store that's it long term. Term. We, we'll know the we'll know the absolute number of uh, BioNTech and Pfizer are working on stability studies that might get some extensions. But as of the last time I got the numbers, this is it. And the sheet that comes with the box that 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 you receive, that's what governs. So you may you may get more up to date information. And so let's say let's say that a pharmacist very practically is uh, has reconstituted their vial. Uh, should they draw up all five doses into syringes and then uh, uh, wait for the patients to come? In other words, store the vaccine in syringes, or should they draw one dose up at a time as patients come in to receive the vaccine? You should uh, draw them up in syringes just in the nick of time for all the usual reasons that that applies to flu vaccine and all other vaccines. You probably aren't labeling the syringes, so you don't want to mess up and confuse one contents with another. Uh, they're proteins, and so uh, stability studies haven't been done on the binding of proteins to plastics if it sits in the plastic for several hours. Um, those, are the, those are the main things. And then, um, uh, yeah, those are the two main things. Right. And so I just want to emphasize again to our listeners, and of course, the BioNTech Pfizer product has this ultra cold uh, temperature storage requirement, which means that it may not be feasible for many community pharmacies to administer that vaccine widely in the community. Uh, but the, the Moderna vaccine, which does have a refrigerated uh, 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 temperature may be more likely. And I know many uh, pharmacists in the past who've done uh, remote flu clinics, mass vaccination clinics, would draw up 10 doses and have them ready and, and go do a mass clinic. But in this case, we're saying we do not do that, that you're going to no. draw up just in time, right? right. That's exactly just in, right. Just in time dosing. Okay. Well, let's move on. Um, uh, we talked, uh, Steve talked a little bit earlier about uh, uh, willingness of healthcare providers to be immunized. And I have a slide. APHA just recently did a survey of pharmacists uh, nationwide to, to talk about the willingness of pharmacists to uh, receive COVID vaccine and to participate in COVID vaccine uh, immunization campaigns. We've shared several uh, uh, additional slides at the end of today's presentation that you can look at after we're done. But 74% of pharmacists responding to our national survey said that they were willing to order and prescribe and administer vaccine in practice and in the community. Now, we did this during Thanksgiving week. That was up from 61% uh, uh, in September. And I think the message here is, is that we know that as pharmacists and other healthcare providers, we tend to be more willing uh, to accept new technologies and new vaccines and so forth when more data becomes available. And that's in fact true here. As more data has become available, pharmacists have become more willing to be involved in the immunization campaigns. And so that's what we're trying to do today, folks, is share with you the latest information so that you can have greater confidence with the administration of vaccines. So very important with that. Now I'm going to um, skip to a question uh, for Mitch Rothholtz right now. And uh, <clears throat> John, we may come back and talk about some patient things in a minute, but I wanna get a question in here for Mitch. Um, Mitch, what uh, what should pharmacists know about the vaccine allocation process? How is it being uh, set out and how will pharmacies <clears throat> manage vaccine allocation? Because these are two dose vaccines. How how's a pharmacist going to handle that? Yeah, good question, Michael. So during phase one, the allocation of vaccines will be managed through the state jurisdictions. And so based upon the recommendations coming out of ACIP, They'll determine within their communities who and where those vaccines will be distributed to. Uh, that also includes the long-term care or the skilled part of the long-term care, the nursing home component uh, allocation there. Providers should not set aside vaccines that they get. That will be ha handled on the back end. So basically, if you get 100 doses, just as an example, use all 100 doses because there'll be a reordering where you'll get your second dose for those patients at a later time. 
Um, and so, again, the message here is don't hold back the vaccine you get. You get it, vaccinate. Um, so that's phase one. In, in phase two, where we get more supply, then there'll be a mechanism through a federal contract and the state contract, and those will be complementing each other in communities. Yeah, that's that's right, and I, I think that's so important. Uh, the good news is is that uh, the feds have planned for this. Now, the other practical question, Mitch, that I think a lot of pharmacists have is, oh my goodness, am I going to need to you know go ahead and stockpile supplies, syringes and needles to be able to give this? Uh, what what's your advice on that? So the, the the federal plan is is that when you you'll get sent the vaccine through one delivery. And at the same time you're getting that, you'll also be getting kits that will complement those doses that you get. So they'll include all the supplies that you need. They'll include the record card uh, for the patients. So the intent is, is that the kit will be everything you need, for example, for the for the Pfizer vaccine, for the, the um, diluting of the vaccine, you'll have what you need there. You'll have the, the um, alcohol swabs, the Band-Aids, and of course, uh, some gloves gloves as well as the the uh, record cards so the intent is you'll have everything you need there that well, way, the the way. As well. mitch maybe you could address this but or john but you're going to get a question now from the pharmacist that will say well, what if the patient doesn't come back in three weeks or four weeks they come back six weeks do we start over again the, the immune the immune system remembers even if you've lost your record card uh you you do not start over you give the second dose even if they're late, just like with all the other vaccines you, you use. Exactly. The same same theory of, of immunization works here as it works with other vaccines. So so uh, let me ask all three of you to react to this because I know this is on the tip of the tongue of all of our audience members. Wow, getting these vaccines to market was awfully fast, awfully fast. Um, do you have any concerns about that? And how is it possible that these mRNA vaccines came to market so quickly? John, I'll start with you, and I'm going to ask Mitch and Steve to talk about their thoughts and concerns, or if you have them <clears throat> related to the vaccine. Tell me about your three experts that you're deep in this. What concerns, if any, do you have? And tell us how this happened so fast. I'll give quick answers like I would give to the public. Um, first of all, mRNAs were quick to produce that could let them be tested. Uh, then there were the, there are many steps to getting a vaccine uh, licensed, assembling all the evidence needed. And in this case, the, this, the, the multiple studies were done almost simultaneously instead of one at a time. And, and that compression in time uh, was what, and, and people set aside other work to do just this. That's, that's like probably the third piece. And that allowed uh, everything to be done. No steps were skipped. They were done simultaneously. And so that's how fast uh, fast things happen. And, and I would also just mention that one thing that I don't know that has ever happened, at least in my knowledge or memory, uh, is that vaccine production was actually started when the research was ongoing. And normally we wouldn't even think about starting production of vaccines right. until we had results from the phase three trials at a minimum, right? That's right. Usually the companies would be doing this, you know, at, at, at risk, at financial risk. If, if this had stumbled, if we hadn't had 95 percent protection, then people would be saying, well, why did you spend my tax, do tax dollars that way? Uh, yeah. But we've got good results. With it. Right. Uh, Mitch, what concerns, if any, do you have? Are, are you confident that this is a vaccine that uh, that you would give your that you would uh, receive yourself or see your family members receive? Well, having been an individual who participated in one of the clinical trials, I did put myself uh, through the process and I'm still here to talk to you. Um, so I, I think that's important. I think the point you brought up about the federal government putting an investment in that they hadn't done before also sped up this process. And we, APHA and other of the, the uh, healthcare organizations have all been calling for transparency in this process. And I think that's an important part. The one thing too is with the new um, approval in, in uh, Great Britain that people were, were saying they were doing the reviews simultaneously. According to my colleague, uh, Lisa Bernstein, that occurs in at FDA's process as well. They are looking at the data 
as the process is going. So it's not that they're all of a sudden starting to look at it. They've been looking at it the same way as they did in Great Britain. Right. Okay. Steve, what about you? How, how Are you uh, looking forward to receiving this vaccine or do you have some personal hesitancy? I've told everybody that I would be the first one in line if they if they allowed me to. And I guess being a healthcare professional and or the only one that's over 65 here that I would be a uh, be one that's, that's there to get it. Um, I think that there are two comments. One, mRNA vaccines are not new. Um, they've been in research for quite some time. Um, they haven't been marketed yet. Um, unless the, I think they've been using some of the cancer trials. Uh, but again, this is not a new process, but it, it's, I'm really thrilled that it actually came to the forefront here because it gives us a chance to look at perhaps future vaccines in a, in a different manner too. With this 95% effectiveness, I mean, uh, if that really would, we could translate that to other vaccines. That would be incredible. The only other thing that I think that we did wrong was we called it Operation Warp Speed. And everybody got the impression by saying that, that it was, uh, we were skipping spaces, but we're, we're not. Nothing has been uh, skipped in this process. Yeah, and I, I would just share that with our my fellow panelists that I have a high degree of confidence. Um, I have reviewed the phase two clinical data, as I'm sure many of our uh, listeners have uh, about the vaccine and was very hopeful going into phase three. And I'll be eager to receive the phase three data next week. Uh, but I do believe that the manufacturers have been very transparent with us up to this point, as has the FDA and CDC. And uh, I'm not uh, expecting any surprises next week when we get the first data in from Pfizer and BioNTech. I think it's going to be uh, uh, good data, and we'll look forward to that. And in fact, next Thursday on our program, we're going to talk about those data. So we'll have a, a little bit of a conversation about that next Thursday. So uh, you'll want to come back and join us next week. Now, um, uh, there's hundreds, dozens of questions, maybe not hundreds of questions in our chat box. <laughs> Keep them coming, folks, but there's no way we'll get to all of them. We're going to just keep asking questions uh, of our panel as we're going along. Um, d John, do we have any efficacy data uh, relative to a person who just gets one dose of the vaccine? So let's say they don't come back for their second. Are they protected against COVID? And how important is that second dose based upon what we know from the phase two trials? And again, I just remind the audience, until we have phase three data, we do not know the answer to that question with certainty, but we'll we'll uh, find out here what we think about the phase two data at least. Yeah, so we don't know. Um, a, the phase three results haven't been released in that detail, and there's, that, there's only a month to collect data, or three weeks between dose one and dose two. Um, from the from the phase one and two studies, the antibody response really needs that second dose. So, uh, you know, it's probably greater than zero, but I, you really want those people to come in for the second dose. Yeah. Um, uh, Steve, has there been any conversation at the ACIP about the use of the vaccine in patients who've already had COVID? So a person has already tested positive for COVID and, and convalesced and recovered. Do they still need to get the vaccine or will they be discouraged from getting the vaccine? Any insights at all you could share with our panel today or has ACIP made any statements about that? They've not made any formal statements about it. There's been a few discussions about the thing. First of all, we don't know the duration of protection of against once you get the virus. So um, the fact that you've had it before is not really a reason to stay away from it. They did make some statement and this has not been, and I didn't read yesterday's uh, publication unless they said it in there, but the uh, if you've had the, the virus within the last three weeks, they said you can really hold back a little bit while other people get it, but it should not be a decision making for the healthcare provider. So you don't have to ask them, have you had it before, et cetera. If everybody that's in that working group should get the vaccine. That's right. And I also want to point out to our listeners that it was a part of the ACIP discussion this week on December 1st that uh, we will not do routine testing of people prior to vaccination. So we will not waste testing resources, uh, testing people to see if they have active infection. If they fit into the qualification under tier 1A to be immunized, you should not hesitate to immunize and give the person the vaccine, regardless of their COVID status previously, and we're not gonna do routine testing. So I think those are very important things to say. Yeah. And we don't know what's gonna happen at the state level. You know, they, they could they could make some changes on, on screening processes, et cetera, but the overall ACIP feeling is that 
we shouldn't be wasting our effort on screening. We should be vaccinating. That's exactly right. Mitch, you had something to add here? Yeah, just one other point to add is in the clinical trials, there are two, they're occurring over two years. So they're really looking at how long will that protection last? So we, those we don't know, we're waiting for results to see. Yeah, Mitch, while I've got you here, let us uh, let me ask you a question about documentation. So uh, a lot has been, uh, you know, a lot of things, people want to return to normal. They want society to return to normal. And, you know, getting society vaccinated is a key part of being able to return society to normal. There's been a lot of discussion in some states and some corporations, businesses. For, inter for instance, the entertainment industry, I saw a news item that said that uh, ticket Master and other concert venues uh, are thinking about requiring uh, ticket holders to show proof of vaccination. And if you have proof of vaccination, you can go see uh, the, the latest concert uh, if you've got proof of vaccination. What role do pharmacists have in documenting and helping patients document um, their immunization status uh, with uh, COVID vaccine? So when providers sign the provider agreements, they're agreeing that they'll hand storage and handling according to, to the recommendations, but also that they will be documenting the immunizations into the state immunization registries. So if you're going to be doing immunizations, you've got to be reporting it in a timely manner into the immunization registries. Um, in terms of requirements for vaccination, um, and Elisa could talk more about this in, in more depth, but in my understanding is these are, since they're being um, authorized under an EUA, they cannot be required. It's a patient's choice whether to get vaccinated. Uh, so again, you know, it's an individual business decision whether they want to let people in or not who've been vaccinated. The key thing for the public to understand is just because you're vaccinated doesn't mean you you have to stop. You you can stop wearing masks and doing other controls. So vaccination is is just one part of the protection model. Um, thank you for that. Uh, John, I just uh, want to reemphasize a point uh, one of our uh, participants have made that we've been hearing that certain uh, ethnic groups have been more disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Uh, and then, of course, we heard uh, from Steve that the data that the disproportionate rate of deaths among long-term care residents by age do you expect that the phase three trial data will include some breakdowns that pharmacists can actually see about minorities that were included in the studies and uh, and and gender of the individuals and age of the individuals? It's already appeared in the in the Moderna press release. There were a little bit less detail in the Pfizer press release, but I'm sure that there'll be uh, substantial information uh, when the fuller results come out. I should also say should say. We already know that these two trials have had far greater representation among the participants, the volunteers uh, of, of African Americans, Hispanics, uh, than is the, has been the traditional norm in, um, in 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 pharmaceutical trials. So, to to a certain extent, it's already a great success at that at involvement, and the data surely will be coming shortly. And, and the um, seniors too. Right, exactly. And I also want to say we've gotten several other questions about, you know, how long after you get the second dose will the vaccine be, will you be protected and some other things of that nature. Again, folks, those are great questions, great clinical questions until we have the phase three. Actually, we know that one, uh, Michael. You so do know the, that one. Okay, the great. The case definition from in both trials was either one or two weeks after the second dose. That's right. when they started the counting. So that is the efficacy window. So at day seven or at day 14, thereafter, that's the efficacy. That's fantastic. And again, next week, we will talk a lot more about efficacy uh, because we'll hopefully have uh, good access to the Pfizer data by that point, and we'll be able to share a little bit more with our uh, participants. Uh, folks, I, I really appreciate all of these questions. We have gotten so many wonderful questions that we just can't get to all of them this week. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, huddle with Dr. Foster, Dr. Gravenstein, and Mr. Rothholtz, and we're going to see if we can't uh, post some of the answers to your questions that we haven't been able to get to today on our APHA Engage platform. And folks, if you are not a member of APHA, we ask you to please join us 
because we're working hard to try to make our profession the best it can be and to advance the profession. And uh, this is just one example of how you can share information with each other uh, through APHA's communication vehicle. So please join us as a member of APHA. Uh, guys, we've covered a lot of information today. We uh, appreciate your help and uh, uh, your knowledge and uh, wisdom as we've gone through this. Um, I want to uh, 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 move on now to a couple of uh, to some CE related matters that we need to cover and also talk a little bit about next week's uh, program. So uh, if uh, the uh, staff will go on to the next slide, please. Uh, one more, please. Uh, just so that you were aware, one of the things that we really didn't have time to get into very deeply today was a talking about uh, the vaccine hesitancy. We know it's real. You all are experiencing it and you are hearing questions from your patients. We have put published a new resource this week at pharmacist.com in the COVID-19 resources section on vaccine hesitancy, how to understand and directly address your patient's concern about vaccine hesitancy. In addition, in today's slide set, we have a, uh, a slide that has information on how to directly respond to your patient's concerns uh, as they come into the pharmacy and ask questions about COVID-19 vaccines. So I encourage you to download that handout and use the resources that we've provided to you to help address some of these vaccine hesitancy issues. We've also updated recently our reimbursement for COVID-19 vaccines uh, resource. And as we learn more, we will continually update that. So check back at pharmacist.com in the COVID-19 resources uh, uh, section regularly. And as you can see, we've got an active link in the handout that will take you directly to those resources as well. The next slide, please. Now, next week, December the 10th, uh, we will, in fact, do this again with the th same three people. Uh, we will have these same three distinguished guests. And in addition, I am able to share with you today that next week we will have a distinguished official from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention also joining our panel. So not only will we have these three experts, a, an a official employee of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention will be online and you'll be able to ask questions directly of the CDC on next year, week's program. And guess what? We're giving you CE next week too. So CE two weeks in a row, you can't beat that folks. I know that's important to everybody. So share this with your friends. If they're online live, they can take advantage of that. Now uh, let's uh, test your knowledge uh, before we get to that CE code. Don't anybody log off yet because you're gonna want the CE code. Let's see if you learned about uh, messenger RNA. Uh, let's launch the poll. COVID-19 vaccines consisting of mRNA. What do they do? Now that you've heard the presentation, Dr. Gravenstein covered this for us. And uh, all right, let's see what the results are. Well, yes, 61% of you got it correct to direct the host cells to express the spike protein. Very good, you learned that concept, that's great. Next question, let's go on. Adverse events can be considered attributable to vaccination, cause and effect if what? If what? I appreciate everybody really uh, being quick on the click. Thank you so much for that. We are very appreciative. That helps us get through all of the content quickly when you're quick on your answers. All right, what is, what is our response on this one? We'll close the poll. Uh, that they occur in recipients more often than among the non-recipients. That's right, that's attributable. And so we're looking for statistical significance. And I do know that we had a lot of questions in our uh, uh, questions today that we didn't get to about adverse events. We've got a couple of minutes and I'm gonna ask John Gravenstein to join me back on camera real quickly um, to talk about adverse events. So. Um, uh, John, uh, you did. Yeah, so can I, can I, uh, maybe this isn't the best question, but um, certainly soreness and, and injection site reactions happen right after vaccination. And, and but it's also that they're happening in vaccine recipients, not in non-vaccine recipients. The, 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 the answer that is really wrong, <laughs> the choices that are really wrong are B and C. Um, just because of, you know, a heart attack after vaccination, 
if if uh, if um, of the people who died after something or other, you know, many of them ate breakfast. Well, just because they ate breakfast doesn't mean they had you know, that, that the death is, they had a heart attack because they, they ate breakfast. It's when you get into the Guillain-Barre's and that sort of thing, it's the, it happens in vaccine recipients more often than it happens in non-recipients. Yeah, and I want to remind our audience that uh, you can access previous episodes of our weekly COVID webinar series at pharmacist.com in the COVID-19 resources page. Several weeks ago, Dr. Tom Shimakaburo from the CDC did an entire episode for us on vaccine safety, and he discussed how the CDC and the FDA are proactively monitoring vaccine safety once these vaccines come to market. So we're doing more. The CDC and FDA are doing more than they typically do to be able to monitor for adverse event signals that occur in the population among vaccine recipients. So uh, we do the normal things like VAERS reporting and so forth, uh, but there's more that's happening. And I'd encourage folks to go back and listen to Tom Shimakaburo's uh, uh, COVID-19 webinar. I think that'll be helpful. John, anything else to add about the adverse events? We should spend some more time talking about it. Yes, we will. We will definitely spend more time talking about adverse events and your, and addressing your concerns about it. I think we have another question we want to ask our audience to get their response to. Uh, ACIP voted on December 1st uh, to include which group as part of 1A? Uh, I think this might be the easiest of the questions that we have posed. We'll see here. Um, it's never fun when the teacher says that, is it? Uh, so I apologize. Uh, but I think uh, we've got, let's go ahead and uh, launch the results of the poll. I think I was right. 95% of you got it correct. All healthcare personnel and residents of long term care facilities were included. And again, we just showed you the summary interim statement today on our slides. Uh, there was a link on the slide to, I believe, to the CDC's uh, publication. There may have not been, but if there wasn't, we'll make sure we launch it. Uh, MMWR on Wednesday contained the three-page summary that has more detailed information about what const who constitutes the long-term care facility residents and types of facilities as well as who constitutes uh, healthcare providers. And there's a little more background provided there. Yes, and you can see the ACIP presentation slides there uh, in uh, the link, and that'll take you to the meeting information. So look for that. And again, I think in this week's MMWR, you'll also find the more detailed information. Well, thank you all for joining us. We have covered a lot of information, and next week we'll carry on this conversation. Again, join us at uh, pharmacist.com on the Engage platform in, uh, in uh, COVID-19 resources in order to be able to continue this conversation until next week's program. In the meantime, be safe. Thank you for all that you do to take care of your communities, and we'll look forward to joining you next week. God bless.